Welcome. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you, John. Okay. This is our second appearance, huh? Together. It's- you know, I, I hear that the second time um, is always sweeter. So I, I, I appreciate <laughs> you. Our second date is so good. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a public venue, don't you okay, think? Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, so um, really had a fantastic conversation um, with you a few months back about privacy legislation. And I hear that privacy legislation is still top of mind for you and for others on Capitol Hill. True? Okay, so um, there is a House Commerce draft that is, has been circulating. There have been various stakeholders who have expressed views on that draft. What are you hearing from stakeholders? Well, we um, put out a staff draft of the legislation with a very intention of soliciting um, stakeholder responses. So we've gotten over 90 now. They're still, they're still coming in. Um, uh, a lot of people on all sides, John, are really not happy. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that's what, what, I mean, we expected that most of the, the comments would say, we think you should do this, you shouldn't do that. Um, and we're in the process right now, really, of processing all of that. The importance is that we want to make it clear that it's not only that we're striving to have a bipartisan piece of legislation, but we want to make sure that we hear all the, uh, the stakeholders and their views. Though I do want to um, you know, disclose clearly that I consider myself a consumer advocate. Um, you know, I'll disclose my biases. Uh, that's what I've been doing all my life, really. That's why I'm so happy to um, uh, chair the Consumer Protection Subcommittee. Um, but we certainly want to have something that can work to the advantage of consumers and all users alike um, and pass. Great. So if folks can get together on the substance of strong consumer privacy protections in a federal bill and can work out some of the thorny issues that Mm -hmm. you've described... It seems like some issues still loom large Mm -hmm. as political issues. Mm -hmm. Private rights of action, preemption, rulemaking. Um, These are not all or nothing issues. How do you approach them? How do you think about those? I'm really really glad that you say that. They are not all or nothing issues. Um, Now, I guess one of the things that's a little frustrating to me that from the very first hearing that we had, Um, It was pretty clear that the Republicans, to a person, talked about preemption. And my attitude toward that has been, that's that's an issue that comes at the very end. If we have a really super strong, wonderful, comprehensive um, consumer privacy bill that is going to meet the expectations of consumers, I'll have that conversation. But also, what you say is true, is that there may be spaces for um, states to exert um, control. Um, My own state of Illinois has a bill that deals with facial recognition issues, I think that is strong and and good. Um, As we know, um, California, as of June, will be implementing their bill. They're they're in the the rulemaking rulemaking phase. Um, And um, my ranking member, Kathy uh, Rogers, her state, is working on on a bill. So there may be space. I don't want to preclude um, that uh, states won't have, will not have a role. On the the issue of of private right of action, you know, the same people who are concerned about rulemaking and don't want it too broad, then don't want private right of action, doesn't make sense to me. I think we have to have a... um, um, a cop on the street, and that would be the Federal Trade Commission. And there, again, still may be space for private right of action. Gotcha. And when we approach these issues, issues like preemption, issues like private rights, mm-hmm. um, the rhetoric in committee hearings and in the press can often be reduced to a soundbite. And I know that as you and your colleagues work on these issues, you have an appreciation um, that it's not easy to treat these complicated issues as a soundbite. Um, there, there's actually That's different right. flavors of preemption. There's different flavors of private rights of action. Exactly. There are continuums there. Do you see, not that we can promise anything, but do you see those as fruitful areas for discussion 
as folks move forward to try to figure this out? I really do. I mean, we certainly, I think, have pretty much bipartisan agreement that attorneys general will have a role of enforcing um, in in states. Doesn't seem to be there's a lot of uh, will to take that that role away, which is an example, I think, of the kinds of conversations that uh, that that we can have. So there's a lot on the table right now. All these comments that are coming in, um, working with the, uh, the the Republicans, but um, I, I think it's absolutely necessary, and I welcome that. So just to know, we're even though we we kind of set a deadline, we're still welcoming the kind of input from stakeholders. Great. Um, now I understand that privacy law, pri- federal privacy statutes, are top of mind for lots of constituents. They're top of mind for lots of users. As we sit here in January, um, November is coming sooner than than we think. Um, And lots of folks, when they think about the state of the net, aren't just thinking about the privacy. They're thinking about the election. They're thinking about the ways that online platforms and services and others um, could impact or will impact the election. Uh, You've thought a lot about this issue. How do you think about online platforms, online services, publishers, advertisers, et cetera, and the state we're in in January 2020 as we move into election season. I'm very concerned about the role that the Internet will play in making sure that honest information is going to be sent out. At the time that we were having a hearing in my subcommittee on um, uh, 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 on dark... Dark patterns. Thank you. Um, that um, dark, dark fakes, uh, deep fakes, I'm sorry, okay, deep fakes, there we go. And deep fakes, not dark matter, deep fakes. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was in California announcing that he will have, that, that Facebook will not take any responsibility for any purchased ad by candidates. So, I'm, I'm thinking about what what does that really mean in terms of the kind of information that we'll get. And by the way, uh, I just brought this article today that tells us that uh, Facebook has uh, reportedly named Jennifer Williams, who was the Fox and Friends senior producer, to be head of the forthcoming Facebook news, dealing with the information one would hope would be true information. So um, while we're talking um, uh, about dark fa- about deep fakes, he's saying n- Facebook doesn't care. I Apparently, even if ads were run and paid for that said, for example, and my opponent is a serial child molester, no problem for Facebook to leave that up. Um, we saw a, a billion dollars or half a billion dollars, I don't know, spent last time, last cycle by, um, the, by, by candidate Trump. And so if, if he plans to spend a billion dollars or more now with made up things, you may remember in the last campaign, it wasn't done by a candidate, but there is a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., and in the basement, Hillary Clinton is running a, a child something, uh, you know, ca- campaign, and you know, child abuse issues. Really? And, you know, there's Which a mark... she was not. Oh, no, she was not. Okay. Hello? To be clear. Fake. And, and, um, and I, 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 I'm very, very worried about it. And Facebook, you know, at the hearing that we were doing... Facebook, in a very sort of friendly way, was described by um, this management person um, as a Facebook is a community of over two billion people that um, crosses countries, language, cultures. That's a quarter of the population of the world for this kind of cozy community. And so there's so much power there and so little responsibility. We could talk about uh, 230, Section 230, and the kind of immunity shield that um, is available 
um, to um, the, the, you know, all of these platforms. And um, I think that it's a real serious issue. I think that, you know, platforms aren't, the, the, the image they want to create is of a bulletin board. You can just put your information out there. But actually, what can be injected into this bloodstream of, ish, of uh, information um, can be very toxic. And I've, I really worry about this a lot, that the election is going to be just one propagation of fake news after another. So I, I think folks who, who observe the dynamic that, that you identify can agree that some sorts of political statements, for example, the federal election has been rescheduled for December 25th, are objectively false. And Correct. That, that, that other sorts of political statements, like my opponent is weak on crime. No problem. Are very difficult to verify or debunk, right? What sort of appetite is there on Capitol Hill today to take a look at either of those categories or what's in between in a way that ensures robust political discourse while addressing potentially fraudulent or dishonest content. Okay, so so Section 230B of the Public Decency Act, was it the... Uh, It's the Communications Decency Act, CDA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think it should be repealed, removed. I think that First Amendment rights are very important. You describe two situations. But the idea that there would be this blanket immunity for the kind of false information that you first described that could be put out on online. I think we need to have that conversation in a serious way. And in fact, in my office, separate from the privacy bill, we are beginning to discuss what kind of language. I mean, this is a, this is a very delicate issue to, to draw that line. When you see it, when you set it, I think people see that there's a very clear difference between uh, my opponent is weak on something and my opponent's done something hideous. Um, and, and so I think we have to uh, moderate that piece of legislation. It, it was passed at a time when this whole Internet world wasn't even imagined. So on the subject of Section 230, um, lots of discussions about revisiting it for a variety of reasons. Um, Is there appetite, I mean, we're sitting here in January, in the short term to have those discussions and then act legislatively in the medium term? Or is there a sense of urgency around these issues that is being driven by the November election? What's What's your sense? Well, first of all, there is a sense of urgency. The question is, can we actually do um, something meaningful about it? I feel a sense of urgency um, that we could have a um, complete fantasy of a message campaign um, in this election coming up in, you know, November 3rd. So, um, you know, we're going to we're going to do our best to lift that issue in as many ways as possible. I'd love to work with um, activist groups, too, to warn people about the information. But I want to tell you, it's harmful. I think it's harmful to the industry if people don't have faith that you can believe in any things that are up there. And it's certainly harmful to our democracy if, uh, if people don't, can't even distinguish between what is true and what isn't true. Um, I, think, I, I think this is really terribly damaging and that it is in all of our interest to figure out how we protect um, the validity of information that is, that is fed. Uh, I, I, I really worry about it. You know, with Facebook, I think it's just, a, it's just a question of money. You can sell all the advertising you want. And by the way, accept any currency it can be paid in um, rubles or whatever. Um, and um, that's, I think that's a big concern for us, us as Americans. Um, so 
that is a sense of urgency around political speech, around political advertising, and around um, the impact of online platforms. It, it seems like there's a sense of urgency around privacy legislation as well. Lots there's of what? there's a sense of urgency around privacy legislation yes, as is. well. Um, drafts in the House. Drafts in the Senate. Um, you talked about the stakeholder outreach. You talked about the fact that uh, your staff and, and you are taking all these comments on board. Mm -hmm. You're working in a bipartisan way. What should we expect next when it comes to privacy legislation? Yeah. Um, well, I, I am hoping that the we're the we're the only um, bipartisan bill right now that I think can really be be moving, and that we're in a in a serious effort to make that. To make that happen, um, you know, we're, my goal is that this Congress, the 116th Congress, that we're able to to do something. We'll see if that's uh, actually going to be. I, I, we could probably pass a partisan bill, but that would be the end of that. Of course, we also have about 200 and. 50 bipartisan bills now that have passed the House, that have gone to the Senate, that are waiting at Mitch McConnell's door. So, you know, even a bipartisan bill, who knows what's actually going to be uh, moving and, uh, and on the president's desk. Consumers, though, I think have a sense of impatience now. Um, there's uh, so much skepticism, so much concern. You know, um, in Sunday's... Uh, New York Times, the author of this big article, said, you know, we think we're searching Facebook, but, I mean, we, th we, we, think we're fa we're, we think we're searching Google, but Google is really searching us. Are we really, are we the product? Are we manipulating these wonderful things on our devices, or are we being manipulated? And increasingly, people are very concerned about um, that their information is not private, that even their health information, when they go... I, you know, I, I'm one of these people, I have one of those um, cards for Walgreens. Um, I like it when I get um, some money back. But I also know that filling a prescription, the pharmacists um, are covered by HIPAA. They're not allowed to share that information. But then... I go and buy over-the-counter things um, that could give clues about my health status right now. And I think people feel very queasy about that. They even feel queasy as they're driving in their car and passing, let's say, a McDonald's and then get, oh, have you tried their new whatever sandwich at, uh, at McDonald's? How do, how do you know? Why do you know that I'm there? In the um, around the holidays um, in Chicago, I do an event with the attorney general and consumer groups about unsafe toys, and we've made a lot of progress on on toys. And um, not there, there's fewer and fewer, but now we have some new toys. These are connected toys, and so parents are thinking, well, you know, is that toy I got for my for my little one? You could track my toddler at the park, um, or my um, middle school kid um, who can be tracked now through the device that I want him to have so he can reach me. Um, and, and so there's all these new concerns. We're going to have a bill, by the way, introduced, um, COPPA, this for children's safety online, and that's going to be introduced um, uh, this Thursday um, by um, Kathy Castor from Florida. And, and COPPA is a, is a long-standing privacy safeguard. The FTC has some rulemaking authority around it, and it sounds like there's a bill on the way to update COPPA. Yes, there is. And it would ex uh, increase the age of children that are covered and protected and a number of other important things. And, and that increase um, to take account, I mean, COPPA currently covers folks under 13 years old. That's right. It's 12 and under. Um, some laws, GDPR in Europe, um, CCPA in California, have set the age at 16. So they've provided additional protections for teens, right. 13 and over, in addition to some of the traditional protections for kids. Um, is that reflective of the 
increasing use amongst teens of very powerful technology? Absolutely, um, without without question. And, you know, we think it's very important not just to warn and scold, um, but actually to put some protections right into the law. And, and as I say that, let me just say, I remember a, a hearing that we had very early on where there was a, a very smart woman and came and told us how as individual consumers we could do things on our devices to really protect ourselves. And she had a whole list of things. Our, what I want to do is shift the burden from the consumer to have to be so smart about how to protect your own information and put more of that burden on the companies who are providing the options for us. So um, hopefully we're going to get that done. So what, one last question um, following that. When we talk about shifting burdens from consumers to companies, how important is it for companies to have clear direction and clear rules of the road? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential that we do that, both for the companies themselves and for the consumers to know what the um, outlines are, um, how they can access and correct and um, get rid of their, the information that, that it's had so that everyone knows exactly what kind of information. We want to have some data minimization so that questions that don't need to be asked um, are, are not asked and you don't have to. In order to get to your end goal, give that information that really isn't important for having something delivered to your home um, that, that you ordered online. Well, I understand that you and I are standing in between folks and the cocktail hour. So I want to thank you um, for joining me and and sharing uh, your views and and the views of your staff and colleagues. I am optimistic that we will get to a baseline federal privacy law. I am very much encouraged that you and others are viewing key political issues like preemption and others not as yes or no, but on a continuum That's to right. be sorted out. Um, and I hope that we can be sitting back here at State of the Net next year with a federal privacy law in place. Thank you so much. That'd be great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Do I take some question or two or no? Sure, I will. All right. Hold on. Hold on. We're, we can take one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? Not for me. I'll have a boring answer. Does anyone have a question for the Congresswoman? Okay, stay tuned. Okay.